Vamos. Boa tarde a todas e todos. Uh, mais, o meu nome é Tiago Pires Marques, sou investigador do SESI em nome da equipa coordenadora do Colégio de Estudos Globais, que inclui a professora Maria Paula Menezes, a Irina Vélico. Quero dar as boas-vindas uh, a todo o público e de forma especialmente calorosa, claro, à nossa convidada, a professora Oyeron que é Umi, a quem agradeço também em nome do SES a disponibilidade para participar uh, nesta sessão do Colégio de Estudos Globais. Um, Professor Oyeronke, um, I was just saying that on behalf of the coordinating team of the School of Global Studies, including also Professor Maria Paula Menezes and Irina Velico, I would like to welcome each and every one attending this session and especially you, our <coughs> guest for this edition. Uh, and to thank you for having accepted our invitation and tell you that we are indeed very happy and honored to have you uh, on board of the School of Global Studies. Um, as you know, this edition was foreseen to take place as an in-presence event, but since that was not possible, we are also very glad uh, about this possibility offered by video conference media to meet, learn and discuss. Thank you, Tiago, very much. My name is Maria Paula Menezes, and uh, it's with great, great pleasure that I am going to introduce briefly Professor Oyeronki Oyeumi, the key speaker of today's session of the College for Global Studies at SES. Professor Oyeumi is a Nigerian sociologist and professor at Stony Brook University in New York City. Her studies discuss gender, feminist theory, and globalization, aiming to debate the African experiences within concepts and epistemologies that are linked to her cultural roots. Thus, a fundamental concept in her work is the notion of woman in relationship. Among her main published works, authored or edited, I would like to call your attention to several of them, many of them actually that are in our library. What gender is motherhood? Changing Yoruba ideals of power, procreation, and identity in the age of modernity. Gender epistemologies in Africa, gendering traditions, spaces, social institutions, and identities. African gender studies, a reader, and African women and feminism reflecting on the politics of sisterhood. These publications by Professor Oyewumi illustrates her contribution as part of a very strong generation of critical African thinkers, today challenging Western feminism. For Professor Ayeronke Oyeumi, Western feminism insists in imposing its own historical experience and structures upon other <laughs> societies, leading to misreading African contexts when applying these perspectives exogenous. And in this sense, it's very important to see how patriarchy and gender are imposed and analyzed in, in African context. The hierarchical domination that produced by this imposition is ratified by difference, translated into conditions of social disadvantage. And the social cultural substrate that designates the global north and its abyssal differentiation from supposedly from the global south is for our guest professor deterministic because it limits and makes judgment from the outside through stereotypes, epistemological enshrined by modern rationality. It is from the visualization of other bodies that a social space that can be occupied or not by certain individual is defined. This opening space for the urgent quest of decolonizing our epistemologies, including how we see the world. The ideas advanced by Professor Oyewumi leads us to reflect on other forms of social organization and conceptions of motherhood and social role played by women. Indeed, gender relations and patriarchy are historical and unstable systems of power produced by modernity. The changes that were introduced specifically as she analyzed through trade interconnections with Yoruba societies and with other parts of the continent led to deep changes in the African social structure, special generational changes in the emergence of a new hierarchical structures based on gender. These changes were further accentuated when the territorialization of European colonialism occurred from the late 19th century on. 
Professor Oyewumi is part of a group of African researchers who seek categories that are endogenous and predate the colonial period in order to think about the continent and from the continent within a broader world in a dialogical way. For our guest, Western thought at such a strong penetration and deep acceptance by several African intellectuals that it has generated African versions of Western works with a distortion of what is particular to the logic of Western societies and what is universal in the sense of an essential truth. I thank Professor Oyeumi for the lectures she will be presenting to us today entitled Decolonizing Knowledge, Recentering African and African Epistemologies in the Quest for Global Transformation. I'm sure you will listen with great attention and after that, we'll have the pleasure to open the space for your questions. Thank you very much. The floor is all, your, is all yours, Professor Ayumi. Okay. Mo fi re fun o shun, mo fi re fun o ya, mo fo i re fun bogbo a mo o ya, a fi mo fo biri, i ye wata akwe ni mo, a fi mo jet o shun, o i ye wata akwe ni mo. Inje eje ka wo le fo biri, o biri lo bi wa, ka wa to de ni yon. Eje ka wo le fo biri, o biri lo boba, ko ba to do risha, o re ye ye o. I was just calling on invoking the goddess, uh, the, the, the god Oshun for this afternoon. Greetings from Lagos. And um, let me just start by saying that I just came off uh, a speech I gave a few days ago because I am the 2021 recipient of the distinguished creation of the US. It's the largest African Studies Association. So I'm the 2021 recipient of the Distinguished Africanist Award of the African Studies Association of the United States of America. That is the largest African Studies Association. The Distinguished Africanist Award was established in 1984. In the 38 years since this award has been conferred, over 50% have been given to white men. 10 to African men, six to white women, two to African American men, one to an African American woman. No African woman has ever been recognized with this award. Thus, I am the first African woman to win this prestigious African Studies Prize. After digesting these statistical facts, the question that immediately came to my mind, which I'm sharing with you, because I hope at the end of my lecture, we can all dwell on that question, was this, what do white men know that the African woman does not know? Please keep this question in mind as I go through my lecture, we should return to it. So today, the call to decolonize universities resonates globally. One group of international scholars articulated it thus, and I quote, for far too long have we lived under the Eurocentric assumption that our local knowledges, our ancient and contemporary scholars, our cultural practices, our indigenous intellectual traditions, our stories, our histories, and our languages are better given up entirely, end of quote. What this all speaks to is the white supremacy that have come to define the modern world. Nowhere is it more poignant than in the constitution and production of knowledge. Eurocentric epistemologies were foundational to the subjugation of conquered peoples and their continuing domination since the inauguration of the modern colonial system. Ramon Grossfogel tells us that genocides were accompanied by epistemicides, death of knowledge, death of different forms of knowledge, death of different ways of knowing. We can also talk about theft and appropriation of ideas and knowledge. Those are some of the things that attended European conquest of different peoples across the world. How did this state of affairs 
come to be? How did the world, current world became so unequal and such an unjust global system? The global hierarchies we inhabit are the legacy of a process that started five centuries ago, which Anibal Kiano, the late Peruvian sociologist called a process that is constitutive of uh, modernity. And that what it did was that a new model of power created new social classifications of the world populations around the idea of race, a mental construct that was naturalized, biologized. And what came out of it is the idea of the innate racial superiority of Europeans as the explanation for why they dominated other groups. In constituting this social classification, Coloniality permeates all aspects of social existence and gives rise to new geocultural identities. Europeans, Africans, Black, White, Indians, those were all new identities that developed as a result of this conquest. The narrative that accompanied Euro-American domination is what is called the rise of the West narrative. It is a narrative that seeks to justify the unequal and unjust global world we currently live in. Parallel to this rise of the West narrative is what I call a degradation of African narrative. What Chimamanda Adichie calls the single story of Africa. Because as the West is built up as superior on one axis, Africa is at the extreme other axis and Africa is always an example of the negative, the, the, um, the inferior and the like. And uh, one of the, the fascinating um, films I, I show my students, a very popular film, I forget the title now, but one of the most striking things about this is that it talks about the conquest of the Aztecs, the conquest of the Incas, and in a very small part, they show a very young African boy. And they said, oh, he was the one who brought smallpox to the Americas. <laughs> it's something as ridiculous as that. The degradation of Africa syndrome that comes out of the rise of the West narrative that we've all been fed. That's why the fact that the elaboration of the coloniality of power was in the, in, was in the crucible of modernity as we are made to understand the Americas, I thought that it was important for Africans to pay attention to it. Because usually when people start talking about the history of modernity of the modern world in Africa, they start with the Berlin Conference. But I also know that part of the problem is because Africans, the way the history has come to Africa is fragmented along the line of, lines of European languages. Because if we were in Angola, we will have no illusion that European conquest started at the Berlin Conference. After all, the Portuguese have been on the shores of, of Angola, of the Congo, since 1482, even before Columbus. And parts of Luanda had been occupied by the 16th century. So we should have no illusion or a very distorted history, which many of us who, who come from quote and unquote Anglophone Africa suffer is to start thinking of modernity and European conquest through the Berlin Conference of, of 1884, which is off by like three centuries. So I want us to bring that forth. It should be understood. I engage with the concept of coloniality of power in an attempt to give historical depth to Africa's uh, multi-layered experience of colonial domination and its consequences. It should be understood that by the time Europe re-emerged on the African shores in the 19th century, Europeans, AKA white people had already benefited from the largesse that African enslavement enabled. And I don't think in talking to a Portuguese speaking audience and people aware, uh, who are aware of the history of Portu the Portuguese in Africa, I don't need to, to emphasize 
the fact that uh, by the 19th century, the Portuguese had been in Africa for, for centuries and they had benefited from the largesse of African enslavement. For example, the Portuguese took Africans from Angola, from the Congo, from all over to the island of Cape Verde to produce beautiful cotton cloth, which they used. And in, indeed, in certain parts, use it as the currency for purchasing enslaved Africans. Most importantly, by the 19th century, Europeans understood themselves to be a different species of humans than the rest. But their self-perception was also different from what they had been a few centuries earlier because they have been transformed by the experiences of African enslavement, the conquest of the Americas and the racial gender system of modernity that had been put in place. They had become Europeans and Eurocentric, which is among other things an epistemological idea. The European of the Berlin Conference of 1884 was already post-colonial, having passed through colonialism, pervert coloniality, and made by colonialism. Consequently, the idea of late colonialism associated with the 19th century colonization of the continent, late in relation to the colonization of America, South Asia, and East Asia is a misnomer. It gives the impression that the global process of colonization and slavery are, are, are different processes and most significantly suggest Africa's isolation from global capitalism to which he had dearly contributed from the very beginning. It is clear that the way in which that narrative has been written did not take into account a lot of the, the history of Portugal in Africa. If we took it from there, some of the myths and, 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 and misinformation that is rife in this narrative would not be that. Recall that when Columbus washed up in Hispaniola in 1492, he had a number of Africans among his crew. I am, I am also saying that the ways in which enslaved Africans were treated in the Americas constituted part of our history on the continent because it produced a fattened Europe that was eager, ready, and resourced to exploit and harvest from a degraded African identity. White supremacy is the current context under which we study, we live, and we meet. This afternoon, I've been tasked to discuss my work and the trajectory of my ideas. In the first part, I revisit my book, which is familiar to you, to most of you, The Invention of Women, and look at how gender is implicated in, the, in knowledge making and the universalization of Eurocentric epistemologies of gender. In the second part, I discuss IFA, a Yoruba knowledge system, and how coloniality is imprinted on it by local and foreign intellectuals. The issue of coloniality of knowledge goes beyond language transforms pre-colonial knowledge systems when they are not totally erased. The great South African intellectual and anti-apartheid activist, Archie Mafeje asked, and I quote, what forms of accumulated knowledge do Africans have and how do we get at it? End of quote. This question or a variation of it has always animated my research and informs the way in which um, I have centered issues of gender, hierarchy, coloniality, and the construction of knowledge about Africa. The running theme of my research and writing is on how structures of inequality shape or even determine what we know, what we want to know, how we know it, and who, where, and when we know it. Knowledge making is imbricated with issues of power and Africa in the last five centuries has the short end of the stick. Gender is a system of classification and therefore a mode in which knowledge is constituted. Thus, a focus on gender categories in my work is also about the construction of knowledge. The global context for research and the production of academic knowledge 
is one in which European concept theories and concerns are imposed and Euro and European and American experiences are taken as the center and the norm. Consequently, the unequal power dynamics between Africa as one region of the world and Europe and America as another is a huge factor that must be considered when conducting research and producing knowledge about Africa. My book, Invention of Women, traces the emergence of gender categorization in Yoruba society of Southwestern Nigeria to European imperialism of body, mind, and knowledge. Uh, drawing evidence from family organization, language, division of labor, religion, oral traditions, I show that unlike in the West, gender was not originally part of the Yoruba conceptual scheme. For example, Yoruba kinship categories are not gender specific. Hence, no single word for son, daughter, boy, and wife are non-gender specific. They are inclusive, unlike English kinship categories, brother, sister. Seniority, not gender, I found was the basis of Yoruba ordering of social relations. Thus, the study concluded that gender as a mode of organizing society is simply not inherent in human nature. Although currently gender has become universal, I assert that this development must be understood in historical terms. I am going to assume you're familiar with invention of women and move to the next section, but we can always, you can always ask me questions. In my book, Invention, I expose gender as a colonial category in Yoruba society, apart from the parochialism of gender binaries like male, female, boy, girl that Europeans took for granted, I exposed the falsity of uni universalizing three assumptions about females uh, and pillars of feminist discourse. The first one, the idea that women are excluded from the public space the one is always in charge of them. And then the third one, given the biology and a deep-seated ideology of biological determinism that social roles are mapped onto bodies. The book invention challenge all these unwarranted universalizations of these ideas, showing that none of these assumptions were true of Yoruba society until Western colonization imposed these tenets. In that volume, I showed that gender is not ontological to the Yoruba. So I'll leave the invention of women alone now and move to African knowledge production in IFA. The epigram that I started with about Oshu is straight out of IFA. IFA is a system of knowledge in Yoruba. In my book, What Gender is Motherhood? Questions of knowledge and gender and the role of intellectuals take center stage. In exploring the intersection of knowledge and gender, I focus on IFA, an important endogenous system. I highlight the role of writing and scholars in the way in which IFA chapters and verses are being in, in, interpreted. At the point, the, the gap between local categories and scholarly depiction, or lack thereof, was glaring in the way in which Ifa knowledge in Yoruba is translated into English. And in the process, what is added is gender. What is clear from the conduct of academics, both local and foreign, is that indigenous categories and experiences did not seem to drive research at least not in the first instance. From the perspective of knowledge making, Yoruba categories of knowledge, the ways in which culture is codified and organized information tended in the main not to influence scholarly claims. So what is Ifa? Ifa is a system of knowledge that was transmitted orally originally, structured into the institution as a set of procedures 
as literary scholar Adie puts it, if our narratives claim divine origins and expressly assert the authority to make proclamations regarding the essential being of every object and idea from the beginning of time and extending into the limitless future. One notable institution that has an immediate relevance to our discussion of IFA, the indigenous knowledge system is the English language. Under British colonization, English was imposed as the official language of the country. Thus, that's why the fact that the original language of IFA is Yoruba, much of the scholarship has been conducted in English, essentially through translation. This fact of constantly translation Yoruba into English coupled with the reality that the primary audience for such writings is an English speaking one has enormous consequences for how Ifa has been written and how it has been interpreted. A basic contradiction apparent in these translations is that English, the target language is a gendered language in which the male category is privileged and Yoruba, the source language, is a seniority based one in which social categories did not indicate the type of anatomy. To illustrate the significant point, I have said this earlier on about Yoruba kinship categories and social categories not being gendered. The sign this significant point is lost on many translators of Yoruba who inadvertently introduced gender into social life and erased the indigenous values merely through translation. This point is easily demonstrated with the imposition of English gendered pronouns through what elsewhere I have called the ubiquitous deadly he. This process is clear in the, uh, okay, I won't give that example. If you want, we can give it later. But now I go to the anthropologist, William Bascom, who was credited with the first full length academic study of IFA. And then in the next section, I talk about the diviners called Babalao, who are the knowledge makers of Ifa. And the concept of Babalao and the category is important because of the way in which Babalao has been, uh, which has been, um, has been translated in a male dominant fashion, illustrates what has happened or what is happening with uh, the Yoruba knowledge system. A close reading of, um, it was Bascom who established without any discussion that Ifa divination is male exclusive. He assumed, and I believe through mis, uh, uh, mistranslation, that diviners are only male. Diviners who are called Babalawu. And the way in which Bascom and some other earlier European scholars came to see Ifa as male exclusive is because they translated the term Babalawu as father of secrets or father of the secret. By translating Baba as father, they assume gendered meaning where it is not necessarily the case. The crucial translation of Baba into father in this instance is erroneous because that's why the fact that Baba is an equivalent of the English father or the French pair it is also a word that means mastery, expertise, or leadership. Thus, the Baba in Babalawo is the equivalent of the English expert in something and not necessarily father of something. Consequently, the word Babalawo is not gendered male. And in actuality, the term is used to refer to both male and female diviners, all of whom have gone through the rigorous and lengthy training to become Ifa diviners and have been inducted into the Ifa order. Babalawo is a mark of intellectual distinction and not 
gender division. Perhaps it is also pertinent to point out that the terms Iya, often translated as mother, and Baba translated as father, in Yoruba usage do not always attach to the anatomy. Thus one may refer to any male or female relative of one's mother as mother because they are seen the matriking. Abe Shaman Malidoma Some describes a similar concept in the Gara culture. And let me quote him quickly. I learned later that Nyagoli was my male mother's son. That is, the, as though the father must be at some point efface himself for the son to survive. And this is when the male mother becomes useful. The feminine in the male, the mother in the man, is an energy that can be triggered into wakefulness only by a male directly related with the mother. The male mother is therefore thought of as someone who carries water the energy of peace, quiet, reconciliation, and healing, end of quote. Although in the Dagara example, some cast this relationship in gender terms. What I want to draw attention to is the fact that these kinship categories in many African cultures are collectively derived and not constructed as individual identity. The same logic applies to male and female relations of one's father, who may be called Father in situations where they are seen to be re representing the patri clan. This conceptualization of family relationships suggests caution in the imposition of gender identity constructs onto the Yoruba world. It is also true that Baba and Iya can also imply dominance, priority, and privilege, and are markers of seniority. I am suggesting that the invisibility of females amongst the ranks of Babalawu is a negative consequence of the impact of the world religions like Christianity, Islam, and other changes that were put in place in a colonial society. A number of European observers such as Bernard Morpoil considered Babalawu a male cult but did point out that they met one or two female Babalawo in the 19th century. As a result, it seemed justified to them based on statistical evidence of the paucity of female Babalawo that this is proof positive of male exclusive cult and that any identifiable female Babalawo is an exception that proves the rule. In my discussion of what I call statistical gendering or categoricalism in, in my previous work, I expose a number of scholarly assumptions that lead to erroneous conclusions about gender in the society under study. In this instance, the making of the categories female babalawo and male babalawo already presupposes a worldview and social landscape in which these gender divisions exist. The statistic then only validates such a worldview. Hence, for postulating the male privileged worldview, rather it is the worldview of the researcher that in the, in the form of gender statistics. Statistics about the gender of Babalao and the distribution of male female diviners is an effect of viewing the society through that lens. It is an epistemological question relating to world sense and what the social categories of knowledge are in the particular society. In the Yoruba world in which these categories, male and female, were not divisions involving social valuation, such a statistic would be meaningless. This is not an argument about numbers or one about how information is organized and understood. Thus, beyond what the anthropologists saw or did not see, we have to pay attention to other factors to explain claims of male privilege in IFA that is assumed in the writing of scholars such as Pascal. Perhaps because IFA was a much revered divination system in Yoruba culture and his babalawo were very influential and much respected. To the Western mind, such a profession would have to be male exclusive. 
In fact, there's information about what sociologists John Peel calls grudging reverence for Ifa by Christian missionaries, both Yoruba and European, and Qurani scholars in Yoruba towns in the 19th century. Peel, interpreting the Church Missionary Society papers, documenting the experiences of Christian missionaries at the time of initial Christian evangelization of the society noted, and I quote, it is hardly surprising that the Babalawo as a body of male religious professionals won a degree of respect refused to the possession priest of other Orisha from the two other bodies of male professionals who offered themselves as interpreters of God's will in 19th century Yoruba land. End of quote. Peel was referring to Christian pastors and Muslim clerics, all of whom were inevitably male, given the requirements of these world faiths. Peel's statement raises the intriguing question as to which came first. The reverence for Ifa because it was perceived to be a male province, or the definition of Ifa as a male province because of the reverence for it. Peel's quote also focuses our attention on the role of Christianity and Islam, the world religions in introducing male exclusive institutions and patriarchal values into the society. To lose in anything, <laughs> so we, we can come back to some of this. Okay, let me go to the last part of this. And it, it, it wasn't my normal last part, but... Um, um, okay, let me do this. What I have been exposing in this process is the messy, and then we're used to reconstruct the past and we make Ifa into a male dominant knowledge system. The dominance of Western ideas about gender and modes of thinking among local and sundry intellectuals leave no room for considering an alternate episteme, such as the Yoruba one. The problem is compounded most especially in gender discourses in that gender constructs are assumed to be natural and universal. Fundamentally, my narrative is about the subjugation of knowledge, which is an important and effective strategy in establishing and maintaining domination. George Bond and Angela Gilliam have considered the practical consequences of subjugation such conjugation when they write, and I quote, they provide justifications and rationalizations for social and intellectual hierarchies, imperial conquests, and the exclusion and subjugation of populations. Let me conclude with this. Gender issues have moved to the very forefront of life and politics in the United States of America. And I want to say, and indeed the world, but right this minute, I'm focusing on the US. What with the emergence of the LGBTQ plus movement and the fight for social justice, the struggle of individuals to choose their own pronouns as if individuals can invent their own language, the fight over who should have access to what bathrooms and the like, and questions about to which category do trans people belong. These are all issues that are riling people in the United States. On October 27, 2021, about three weeks ago, and I quote, the United States issued its first US passport with an X gender marker, acknowledging the rights of people who do not identify as male or female, end of quote. All this is evidence that the Western gender paradigm has failed. The Eurocentric model of rigidly defined, biologically determined gender binaries universalized through imperialism has failed. The Eurocentric model has failed 
but not before this biologic has contributed to the creation of masculinist monsters. The violence against women is at an all time high, not to talk of the intersectional trauma that terrifies so many people across the world. In contrast, what research shows is that African social categories historically were fluid, non-binary, non-biologically determined. You don't need to choose your pronoun if you speak a host of African languages, including Yoruba. And all these African languages, African categories were nested in social institutions that were non-gender exclusive or non-gender. And these institutions were focused on generational reproduction. For example, the African cosmic family is a paradigmatic example of the fluidity and the borderlessness of African social institutions. The family, or what a group of scholars have named the cosmic family, and I like their concept, I didn't originate it, I wish I did. The African cos cos cosmic family is understood to be vast, consisting of many who have passed on, a few who are living, and countless members who are yet unborn. Imagine if we were guided by such a vision. Would we be so cavalier and destructive of Mother Earth? that sustains us, it is time to center Africa. Africa is a treasure trove, not only of Benin bronzes or coltan from the Democratic Republic of Congo or diamonds from Botswana. The real unmined gem are African concepts, ideas, values, ways of being, systems of knowledge, episteme, and the longest experience of being human, the longest experience of occupying this environment, Earth, without destroying it. Let us stop burying Nobuntu, the mother of humanity. If anything, the lesson of the gender discourse is that we must look to Africa. Thank you.